Keith Kroc is the chairman of the board at DocuSign, a company he took public earlier this year with a market cap of over $6 billion. There are only a few entrepreneurs in B2B who have been successful with category creation, but Keith stands out for having done it not once, twice, or three times, but with four separate companies. GMF, Razna, Ariba, and DocuSign have all curbed the traditional disruption go-to-market and dominated the industry that they themselves had built from the ground up. I needed to look at his playbook. So from the historic Fox Theater in Redwood City, California, this is B2B Creatives. Hey, Keith, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Anthony. I appreciate it. For sure. Well, I, I wanted to start with a quote that I saw you post on social media a little bit ago. It said, people can deny your logic, but they could never deny your enthusiasm. And you attributed that quote to your mother. And so can you tell me a little bit about uh, just the influence that Mama Croc has had on your career? I mean, that totally uh, epitomizes Mama Croc. She's probably one of the most passionate, enthusiastic, positive people around. She's 90 years old now. I, matter of fact, I was with her this weekend. My, my uh, oldest daughter got married. And, you know, one of the things, we were just kind of sitting back, philosophizing a little bit, and she goes, you know, it's very important to find the positive uh, thing in every, peop in every person. Yeah. She goes, it's kind of like playing hide or go seek, find them. And uh, she's an amazing lady, you know, and uh, growing up, you know, she was a tough, she was a tough mom, but, uh, uh, you know, she would always say to me, uh, Keith, would you rather take out the garbage or do your homework? Go, well, I'd rather do my homework, mom, you know? And she, I remember once she goes, you know, you're just lazy, Keith. You've got to be the president of every organization because that way you can delegate all the work, you know? I mean, it's, it's stuff like that. I'll never forget we brought her to uh, an early DocuSign All Hands meeting because I would always show these little clips of uh, Mama Croc because I would always say, you know, the DocuSign's value proposition is so easy that uh, even my 85-year-old mother back in Rocky River, Ohio in a bridge club, uh, you know, understand it. Yeah. So, so, I, so I brought her once when we were announcing uh, the digital transaction management category. And she, and she just like, we probably only had about a thousand people there. And so I'm just, you know, as I'm introducing her, she just grabs the mic right out of my hand. And she goes, who wants to hear Keatsy stories? <laughs> and uh, the place went like nuts. And then she goes, and then she just goes, well, everybody asked me what it was like to give birth to Keatsy. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. He slid right out, and he's been sliding <laughs> through life ever since. And the place just went nuts. So many people erupted. were spitting out their cough. And she goes, he's a freeloader. I mean, it's just, that's my mom. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, it sounds like that's, you know, you attribute some of your enthusiasm from, from her, from, yeah. from mom. I want to touch on enthusiasm just one more time. Um, Enrique Salem, managing director at yeah. uh, Bain Capital Ventures, he referred to you as, and I'll quote one more time, a force of nature, exceptionally positive, visionary leader, whose energy and enthusiasm are both infectious and empowering for those around him. Now, you've built a career in, in B2B for the most part, right? B2C as well, but why does energy and enthusiasm matter? Like, why, why should CEOs, why should entrepreneurs, aren't we selling software at the end of the day? Well, you're not, yeah, it's beyond selling software. I think, uh, as you know, Anthony, um, it's all about building trusted relationships it's all about um, people understanding your vision, creating a movement. Um, people love to follow people who are fun yeah. um, to be around. And um, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's not easy. And it's actually, that aspect of it is key to being an innovative at scale. Inventing is one thing, mm. but being able to innovate at scale and go global um, uh, you know, creating that positive environment and encouraging the heart yeah. is such an important part of being a role model, uh, which is the ultimate form of leadership. Totally. No, I completely agree. And I think of some of these, you know, personality tests or whatever it is for, for executives and the, the one, um, I think five dynamics is the one that comes to mind. And you look at excite as one of those kind of key pillars mm -hmm. for, for senior executives, because you have to 
live the brand, you have to sort of be the personification of the movement that you're creating. Yeah. So I totally. Yeah. Uh, and that, that, and as you know, uh, you know that passion is infectious. And yeah. when you're building a company, it's not just the employees. It's I call it the extended family. It's yeah. the entire ecosystem. So it's your partners, your customers, your prospects, your advisory board, all of that. Right. Right. Well, I want to take it back to college for a moment. Purdue University, class of 1979. Uh, and you and I actually have something in common here. We're both members of Sigma Chi fraternity. And I know that a lot of people watching or listening, Greek life might have been something you know, that they did. But, but for you and, and for me, this is much more than just an undergraduate kind of experience. Yeah. So I'm curious, how did the values of the fraternity kind of shape some of your leadership um, kind of framework and the leadership approach that you yeah. kind of brought with you? Yeah. I mean, the Sigma Chi fraternity uh, changed my life. I was just a you know guy from a small town in Ohio showing up at Purdue, and so I had instant friends, instant trusted relationship. But the values of Sigma Chi uh, that we espouse: courage, wisdom, integrity, high ambition, self-control, courtesy, fidelity to principle, have guided me my whole life, and I think. Um, it has formed the basis of all the companies that I've had the honor of help build uh, along my career. And, uh, uh, you know, one thing that, um, you know, companies may, may come and go, you may have successes, you may have failures. People, and by the way, the more successful you are, the more, um, you'll be in the spotlight and be criticized. But one thing they can never take away from you is your values and your integrity. And uh, that's certainly uh, the greatest gift that Sigma Chi gave to me. Yeah, to totally agree. And what I've loved um, being on the other side, kind of watching you sort of, you know, kind of build and, and, and kind of crystallize a lot of that vision for the fraternity um, is, is kind of how you're developing it into a transformational leadership kind right. of approach. Right. And you're doing a lot of um, you know, writing right now and speaking right. about the six different transformations that you're leading. Um, and the one in particular was higher education that right. I'd love to hear more about. So tell me just a little bit about um, how transformational leadership in particular is what you sort of anchored on is like, this is my, my purpose, my meaning. And then yeah. I'd love to learn more about the higher education bit. Yeah, so um, I think, um, the biggest, uh, it, the thing that gives me the biggest adrenaline rush is the transformational part mm -hmm. of leadership. And, you know, if I would say, what's transformation in a word? It's change. And change is the most positive word mm -hmm. in any language. And without change, we don't develop, prosper, or grow. In the business world, you either change or you die. Right. But it carries over to, uh, you know, pretty much everything that uh, I've been involved with. And basically it means don't accept the status quo, right? And we did it by creating a new vision for Sigma Chi, focus on uh, values-based leadership, and also for Purdue University, I had a great privilege of being the chairman of the board of trustees at Purdue and, uh, and appointing Mitch Daniels, who's the president now of Purdue. And we've made some radical, uh, changes focused on um, on the students themselves, and a, a key aspect of it is student affordability. So, we, so we've frozen tuition for the last seven years, which is unprecedented. We bought uh, Kaplan University to serve as our online technology uh, platform that we are using to create a two-sided network, and we announced Purdue University Global. And a big focus of that is also retraining the workforce. And here again, that goes back to transformational leadership in terms of impro improving uh, the productivity of the world. Yeah. And I believe in technology to automate uh, things, whether it's robots, e-commerce, digital transaction yeah. management. But uh, now I think the challenge in front of us is retraining that workforce. Mm. And that's a big, that's a big focus. Uh, for Purdue is a land grant mission. So to, yeah. to so to be part of that, it's been a been a great honor with Mitch. That's awesome. And I, I want to. We're going to come back to that here in a second. One thing. 
that I'd be remiss I didn't mention is you just came back from New York earlier this year. Congratulations on the IPO with DocuSign. Um, this was number three for you with uh, Angie's List 2011 and Ariba, of course, back in uh, 1999. Um, 19 years since the Ariba one in particular. How did this one feel? How, how did this one compare? Yeah, well, you know what's interesting because uh, Ariba, everything happened so, uh, so fast and it was my first time. Uh, DocuSign, it was like a beautiful slow motion movie. I mean, you kind of knew uh, what was uh, gonna happen. And, um, and we also, uh, we've been practicing being a public company for three years, you know, quarterly earnings calls and everything that goes uh, with that. And, uh, you know, it ended up to be the, the largest enterprise uh, software IPO by revenue uh, ever. So. You know, it was kind of it was kind of special, it, and it really didn't hit me uh, until I looked over my chief of staff, Hero Rodriguez. He was there, and all of a sudden, I'd see him. I see him in tears, you know, and uh, I cry Camel Soup commercials, and uh, you know that stuff's contagious too. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, it was really heartwarming, and, and very rarely in the business world. Do you, do you get years of blood, sweat, and tears, big team all coming together, and it manifests itself in one day. Yeah. And uh, even though it's just a financing event, and it's, it's not the end, it's the beginning, but still, it was great to celebrate. And what made me really proud was that uh, the rest of the DocuSign family all over the world, on that day we went public, uh, they focused on giving back through our DocuSign Impact Foundation. And uh, because we've been very fortunate, to, so to help out, uh, you know, people who are less fortunate than us. Mm -hmm. And so I just think that it was, that to me made it a celebration. Totally. What a cool concept, honestly. Yeah. That's such a great way to, to celebrate by paying it forward. Um, you know, one thing I want to talk about is category creation. Uh, it's a topic close to my heart at Gainsight as we're trying to build this whole customer success market. Um, Profile Magazine, referred to as the category kingmaker, um, having done this not once, but four times, and I'm gonna try to get this right. Robotics industry at GMF, mechanical design synthesis at Razna, B2B commerce, of course, at Ariba, and digital transaction management at DocuSign. So I have to ask, why? Why create a category? Why not disrupt an existing kind of you know player out in the space? Well, I always say, why build a product when you can build a category, and uh, and create an industry? So also the way I look at it too is the objective of the game is to be the category king, mm -hmm. and if you start that category, your chances of being the category king are much greater. And then why be the category king? Well, the reason why is because 80% of the resources go to the category king. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the objective of, uh, of doing that. And to really, you know, if, whether you look at creating business to business e-commerce, mm -hmm. whether you look at digital transaction management, no matter what you um, look at, it's, it's really marketing that category at, as a noble cause, mm. and uh, and certainly you know that's happened. Now you look at Ariba as 1.3 trillion of commerce going through it on an annual basis, more than Amazon, eBay, and Alibaba huh. combined. You look at DocuSign, 300 million uh, customers uh, and users, 370,000 companies um, on the DocuSign Global Trust Network. So uh, you know it's changed the way business is done changes in the way people live their lives mm -hmm. and uh, creating frictionless commerce around the world. Yeah, that's so awesome. It's not just about creating the category, but it's about realizing the outcome, which is creating outcome for the customer, creating the jobs, as you mentioned, but also obviously the business outcomes are just part of, part of the journey. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's great. What I found when we sort of, you know, I like to say category creation wasn't something we sought, it sort of, found us, we labeled it, at least what we were doing in the early days, as category creation at Gainsight. But what I also found is I, I would research and try to find a, like, what are the best practices yeah. around doing this? There actually aren't that many, at least publicized right. on how to do category right. creation. But having done this four times, I'd imagine you've got some type of playbook here. 
Um, and in one particular I wanted to ask about without uh, spilling trade secrets is, yeah. is pattern recognition. Yeah. That's a word that, that you've, you've yeah. used talking about it. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, what I mean by that is that you know, if you look at the, in, in, you know, my early days of category creation, did a lot of experiments because there was, there's not, you know, this stuff is not written in a yeah. book. Let me put yeah. it that way. And you learn what works and you also learn that doesn't work. So when you go on to the next adventure, to the next category, you keep the stuff that works yeah. and do a little more experiments. You don't do the stuff that, that doesn't work. And after a while, um, you do, you get tremendous uh, pattern recognition. And uh, um, what's interesting for me is I'm working on a, a piece in category creation and it has 54 concepts, you know, a spreadsheet and seven key strategies. And, and you know, you hardly realize that until you kind of look back, but um, uh, very, you know, these strategies in terms of, are basic too, mm -hmm. in terms of it all starts with the customer, right? And it all starts with uh, learning, testing, and leveraging your customer. Because your customer, when they sing your value proposition loud and clear, that is the ultimate uh, kingmaker, sure. you know, right there. And, and to understand, um, to market that category nobly, and to have an enemy mm -hmm. and to have a, a uh, noble mission and how in terms of uh, neutralizing potential competition, the best way to do that is to have strategic partnerships mm -hmm. and to create that flywheel in terms of, of building a network. So a lot of those things um, uh, are very doable. A lot of people go, oh yeah, no, you can't create the category. Gardner and Forrester create the category. <laughs> that's well, right. that's the last thing you want to have is to put those guys, have them put you in one of those quadrants because they're going to put somebody re real close to you and, they, yeah. and many times they don't understand the nuances. I mean, it's, of course it's their job, but yeah. uh, it's the customer that decides in the end. It's funny you mentioned analysts. That was our, our uh, fork in the road right, where we, Nick and I had been at the company for less than a month. Um, and we signed the deals with Gartner Forrester and the rest. Um, and we would pitch the value proposition. Yeah. We'd have our customers get on the yeah. phone with them and they'd look at the, at the boxes and say, you are proactive customer right. support. We're right. like, kind of, you are CRM. Right. We're like, well, look, we're not ready to, to, right. to make that uh, claim. And what we found is we were a little bit of each of those things, right. but not the whole thing. And so we said, look, there's got to be right. another way, right. which is where we sort of kind of went down this journey. Right. And, and you know, one of the key things, like when I think about Ariba, we didn't go visit those analysts until uh, we, we had customers, they were using the product and they could quantify their value proposition. And I remember when we were laying out uh, Ariba, mm -hmm. uh, and I can't remember which one, but they're all in Boston, it seems like. <laughs> and and uh, they're going, well, you know, come back to us. Uh, you know, we don't know if this is right. Come back right. to us when you have customers. Well, actually we have Cisco, we have Federal Express, we have Visa, we have AMD. They're all up and running. And, um, and they're, you know, it's like Butch Cassidy and Sundance <laughs> kids. Like, who are these guys yeah. anyway? Yeah. So I think that's one of the um, key things is you don't want to go out there uh, prematurely right. and the customer's everything. Customer's at the core of it. Um, you mentioned something earlier about um, marketing the noble cause, something yeah. along those lines. Um, and obviously in getting to know you in time, I know building a great team is at the core of yeah. sort of the execution front yeah. of, of some of this. Um, I'm curious about your relationship as a CEO building a new category with your, your CMO or your yeah. marketing team. What What's your expectation for the marketing's role yeah. in executing your vision? Yeah. yeah. There's no doubt about it, the number one job of a CEO is to build a high performance team. Mm -hmm. And the way I look at it is you want to build a well balanced mm -hmm. team. So, you, you know, we would always say in our playbook, you just don't want to be technology driven or sales driven or finance driven. You want to have a well balanced attack. It's like putting together an all pro football mm -hmm. team, right? Um, and the CMO is such a critical part of that because the CMO. Um, is the centerpiece for the strategic positioning mm -hmm. that everything radi radiates out from that. And uh, whether, and everything that goes into that in terms of monetizing and pricing and packaging, getting that word out, 
um, creating evangelists, building the advisory board, giving air cover for the sales folks. So I look at the CMO is the key to being to uh, scale the business mm. and being able uh, uh, to be able to at scale get the value proposition out. Mm. Um, you know, it's one thing to invent something, but it's another thing, uh, you know, to to uh, get it worldwide use. Yeah, to make it happen, to make it inevitable yeah. ultimately. Um, so part of my belief, and I think with this whole show, is that we're B2B marketing is changing um, in that, in the, in the old world brand, an old, old world brand yeah. mattered. And then in the digital economy, it yeah. was like, well, look, brand and corporate marketing is important, but yeah. it's all about growth. Like right. we got to grow right. and they were disconnected. But in the new world, um, you know, we, we're in, we got these iPhones on, ours, on us. We're, the lines between work and life are so blurred. We're right. inundated with emails and information from right. marketers. Right that I think there's this renaissance happening where we're yeah. trying to get back to the customer. Right? Right. We're trying to get back to human right. connection. Have you seen the same, at least in the sense of brand evolving over yeah. the years or? Yeah, it, be, because if you look at everything that's going on in terms of you always having an iPhone and the social media, yeah. you just get bombarded with yeah. about 100,000 messages a day. And this, here again, this is why category creation is so important because it creates in one's mind yeah. kind of a file cabinet where it's like, oh, okay, I got it. It's very, very simple. Yeah. Um, and then if you can take it one step further, you know, like DocuSign, oh, well, that's a verb. I mean, mm -hmm. just DocuSign it, right? right. Um, and, and that becomes the cognitive reference mm -hmm. um, for that industry. And that is just, uh, that simplifies mm -hmm. that, that marketing message because you have to get through all this shrapnel of yeah. you know, 100,000 different messages right. are hitting you uh, left and right. And, and what is memorable uh, is absolutely key, not just the company's name, not just that it's a verb, but what it can do for each person. Right. And more importantly, what is the feeling mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it personifies. So for example, DocuSign, it's like, oh, I closed the deal. Yeah. I got this dream home. I got my first loan. Right. Um, you know, so it can be uh, a moment of euphoria. Yeah. Right, and so that is the, I think that's the key, and I think yeah. that's the new wave of uh, CMOs in this world, and it's, whether it's B2B or B2C or even B2G, <laughs> you know, uh, business to government, it's the oh, same thing. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I, I get the sense um, that another part of the marketer's role in building the brand is executive comms, and this is something that I think you, you've done such an amazing job of. Um, You've spoken at events, uh, you've done interviews like this, you talked about writing for, for HBR. Um, what's, what's your advice to CEOs or founders who are uh, you know, thinking about executive comms, building their profile as an extension of the company brand? Yeah. Is it important? Um, I, I think it is from yeah. what I've seen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, here's why it's important. Of course, it's important to get the word out, but if you think about why does somebody mm -hmm. buy your solution it's because they trust you yeah so building trusted relationships is at the key of building a company building a category mm -hmm. selling your product and so you know um you have to be good at building trust relationships now in business everything is divided by time mm -hmm. so an ability to connect with one person over a lunch or a dinner and to build a trusted relationship is key in the business-to-business -business, uh, world. It's actually a superpower yeah. if you can do that. So how do you do it at scale? Well, if you're not afraid to be vulnerable one-on-one, -on -one, don't be afraid to be vulnerable in front of the camera mm -hmm. because people want to see uh, that CEO or that CMO. What do you stand for? Right. Um, what's your background? What's your beliefs? What do you look like? Yeah. What do you sound like? Um, and that's a very, very part, an important part of uh, the marketing aspect of the equation. Yeah, I think it's so important. And I, I get this next question all the time when people watch Carpool Karaoke. Thank you, by the way, for being a big part of that. With that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Um, and they're like, that was amazing. 
I'm never going to convince my CEO to do that. How do you get, you know, Nick or Keith or whoever to be willing to be vulnerable? Yeah. And so I'm wondering, in, in a world where that's like an uphill battle, like, what do you think? Like, how do you, how do you make that pitch? Well, I, I, I think it comes down to what's the most effective form of leadership? Yeah. And, you know, they do all the studies, all that. It's being authentic. Yeah. And some people um, ha have different styles. And by the way, there's no one style that mm -hmm. uh, is the secret of Lex, but being authentic in your style is key. And I think, um, uh, you know, be, being authentic, whether you're standing up in front of um, all your employees or you're doing carpool <laughs> karaoke, you know, it's important to admit your failures, your fears, your flaws, because your employees, even your customers, they know them anyway, or they soon will, so why not have fun with them? Yep. And I also think a superpower is a self-deprecating sense of humor. Totally. And uh, it, I mean, it's just, and it just makes it fun. Yeah. So, um, and the way I look at it, you have nothing to lose. Right, right, I totally agree. Well, Keith, youngest uh, vice president at General Motors, three IPOs, major acquisitions. What's next? Like, what's next for you? Well, you know, I think, uh, I think at this, at my station in life now, it is about uh, giving back and giving back to that next generation of leaders, entrepreneurs, uh, innovators, um, and to give them uh, the courage the inspiration to not be afraid to jump in water over their head and maybe to give them some of the how to's, you know, from uh, an old battle tested uh, warrior, you know, uh, of the victories, but also uh, the defeats. So I, I think um, to be able to mentor at scale is key. I've got some concepts to be able to do that. That excites me. Uh, I'm putting together a plan on that. I think another one too is, you know, I had a chance to give back uh, to my university, to my fraternity. Um, I've been very fortunate uh, uh, in my life and I love to give back to my country. I mean, uh, you know, I grew up in a little uh, town in Ohio. Uh, my dad had a five person machine shop in the good times. In the tough times, it was just him, him and me. I never thought I'd get the chance I would. And to put many of the things that uh, I've learned to pay back, uh, increase the productivity of, uh, of the United States, um, and to really raise the, um, the living standard yeah. per capita. Um, and to put, uh, you know, many things I've learned in terms of uh, global commerce, um, and retraining the workforce, and even, uh, I think that can even help in terms of uh, doing those things at scale, things like prison reform. Yeah. So I think, uh, and maybe I'm just a patriotic guy from Ohio, but I think right. really giving back to my country in some way, shape, or form, I have no idea, but yeah. uh, I just think, uh, I, I think now it's a, uh, it would be a, a privilege and a duty. Awesome. What a noble, noble cause indeed. Absolutely. Um, well, Keith, we've spoken a lot today about your leadership, your enthusiasm, category creation. One thing that I think is not spoken enough about you is your generosity. And I want to talk a little bit about an experience I had in college. Um, one of the best experiences of my life um, was a summer of 2000, let me get this wrong, six, I think, uh, Snowbird, Utah, where I went through a program called Horizons that was really built around leadership development. Right. And I can trace back a lot of the things that I do today in my role at, in, at Gainsight to lessons that I learned uh, through Horizons. And that program, um, I think 60 kind of folks were a part of it, paid for, paid for in full. And, I've, and the name on, on that was, was Keith Kroc. And so I just wanna thank you for everything you've done for me, for all of the folks and all the lives that you've touched. Really, you know, you're, you're incredibly generous and excited to see kind of where you're headed from here. So, well, thank you, thanks. Anthony. That means yeah. a great deal to me. Thanks for being on the show. My right. honor. Thank, thank you. you.